beginning church and our online family and friends thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight I received a text from Dolores Sattler and I want to share that text with you and it reads have you ever done the wrong thing and wish you could undo it or said the wrong thing and wish you could take it back or written an email or letter and wish you could permanently delete it. Well, it happens. We can be thankful that unlike people, God doesn't videotape what we do or tape record what we say or save our unwise mail. He gives us a chance, many chances, to just to get it right. He just keeps on loving us. God is so good all the time. Now our song tonight says, God is a wonder in my soul. And you might not know that song, but if you listen to it, you will know it. It says, God is a wonder in my soul. God is a wonder in my soul. Came into my life one day and took all my sins away. Oh, God is a wonder in my soul. And John 10 and 10 says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's John 10 and 10. God is a wonder in my soul. God is a wonder in my soul. took all my sins away. Oh, God is a wonder in my soul. Help me sing, please. God is a wonder in my soul. God is a wonder in my soul. Came into my life one day and took all my Sing that again. God is a wonder in my soul. God is a wonder in my soul. Came into my life one day and took all my sins away. Oh, God is a wonder in my soul. My God's truth has set me free. Yes, Lord. My God's truth has set me free. Came into my life one day and took all my sins away. Oh, my God's truth has set me free. can live abundantly. Now I can live abundantly. Came into my life one day and took all my sins away. Now I can live abundantly. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, again for blessing us to come this far. And we thank you for blessing us, Father God, to honor you in song. 
and praise and in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for another privilege. For, Lord, we know that we don't deserve it. You've given us another chance because of your mercy and your grace. Now, Lord, we pray, Father God, that you keep us tonight. Bless us in your word. Bless us through your word. And bless us to study your word, that we will take forth your word, that lives will be changed and lives will be renewed and hope will be developed, Father God, and those that live in hopelessness. We pray that you bless us now, and we thank you for being a wonder in our soul. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. God is a wonder in my soul. Yes, he is. He is. He is. God is a wonder in my soul. Our God, our God is. came into my life one day. Yes, he did. And took all my soul. He is a wonder in our soul. He is God himself. He has, has blessed us again, together again in his name. And we, thank, we are thankful to God for giving us another chance. Are you grateful to him tonight? Amen. Amen. Are you thankful to him? We want to thank God for allowing Sister Cora Woods to be in the house. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Sister Cora Woods could not have been here. She, oh, Jesus. She could have been dead and gone, but God has given her Amen. another chance. And, and as I said on, on Sunday morning, she had every excuse in the world for not to be here. And she was here Sunday morning, and she's here again tonight. It, would, it wouldn't take but four drops of rain, or four promised drops of rain to get 20 Christians to stay at home. Thank you, Sister Wood, for being Amen. faithful. Faithful to the Lord God Almighty. Sister Davis, we're in 1 John chapter 2. Sister Davis, we're in 1 John chapter 2. You are might. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we're looking at verses 1 through 6 on tonight. Amen. Verses 1 through 6 on tonight. Amen. 1 John chapter 2. In the back of your Bible, right before you get to Revelation, you will find 1, 2, and 3 John. We're in 1 John chapter 2 tonight. We have covered chapter 1, and we realize in chapter 1 that, that the apostle John is talking to believers, those who are born again, those who are saved. He's talking to believers. My question tonight is, is he talking to you? He's talking to those who are saved. He's talking to us. And he begins chapter 2 by addressing us who are believers. He begins in chapter 2 by addressing us who are believers. He begins. What, is, what are the first three words he says in, in chapter 2 of 1 John? What are the first three words he says? My little children. My little children. He says, my little children. First of all, he's addressing them as an apostle, one who has walked with God. He's addressing them as an apostle, as a father of the faith. John, the apostle John, is addressing them as a father of faith, as an apostle. He's addressing them as an apostle. He addressed them as his little children. This phrase, little children, means little born ones. Little born ones. So we must conclude tonight that he's addressing those who are new in the faith. But they are born again. So he addressed, these are grown people, right? He's, ad he's addressing, addressing grown people as little children. Now, if I was to use that phrase tonight without you looking at 1 John chapter 2, if I was to use that phrase tonight and call you little child or little children, somebody would leave it with attitude. Anybody? Would it be you? somebody would leave with an attitude if I stood up and I said, hey, little child, 
Uh, hello, little children. And they will really blow a gasket if I said my little children. So the Apostle John addresses them as my little children because he's speaking from an apostle standpoint. Little children mean that they are born ones, born ones, new in the faith. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. You see, the apostles wrote so men can avoid sin. The preacher preaches so men, women, boys, and girls would avoid sin. So he says, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. He didn't say you will not sin. But if you walk with God, you won't sin. He says, he's already said in, in the previous chapter that we're going to sin. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. <clears throat> and then look at verse number 10. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. If you say that you have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We think we're deceiving other folk. But we are only deceiving ourselves. Verse number eight, first John chapter one, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He says the truth is not in you. Look at, look at, let's continue to verse number nine. If we confess our sins, he, who is he? God is faithful and God is just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, in verse number eight, he says, if we say we have no sin, meaning that we have that sin nature about us, we have a sin nature. And guess what? Our sin nature loves to sin. It's the nature we got from Adam and Eve. We just love to sin. If we say that we have no sin, then we tell a lie. Verse number 10, if we say that we have not sin, in other words, past tense sin, and you come to this conclusion that you have not sinned, look at what he says. We make him a lie and the word is not in us. Now, we all know it's impossible to make God a lie. So if we say we have not sinned, if we say we have no sin, then we're telling a lie. He goes in chapter two. He says, little children, I write these things unto you that you may not sin. Says that you may not sin. And if anyone sin, if anyone does sin, he said, I'm writing it to you so you don't have to sin, so you won't sin. I'm writing these things to you so you won't sin. But then he says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Let's unpack that. He says, children, the born ones, the darlings. This word, children, darlings, my, my little darlings. My, he's talking to converts. He says, I'm writing this to you so you will not sin. I'm writing this to you so you won't miss the mark. I'm writing this to you so you won't error. Sin. I'm writing this to you so that you won't fall short. The Apostle John says, I'm writing this to you so you will not sin. 
But just in case, and we know it is a case, not if you sin, just in case when you sin. We have an advocate. What's the advocate? We have, a, we have an advocate. The advocate is one who speaks to God on our behalf. He pleads our case. This word advocate is a, a jury, a courtroom. It is a courtroom room term that, that says that when you have an, a, a prosecuting attorney bringing charges against you, we got Jesus as our defense attorney. He's our advocate. He's the one that speaks to God on our behalf. Let me tell you something. It's a wise thing to take a, a lawyer to court with you. But you need a good lawyer. You need a good lawyer. And when you go to court, the first rule that the lawyer is going to lay down is that I speak for you. You stay quiet. So when you have a good lawyer and Jesus is the best lawyer you can ever have. He says, we have an advocate. The advocate is Jesus, the righteous one. This advocate is our defense attorney. This advocate speaks on our behalf. This advocate defends us even when we're guilty. Because remember now, he says, if you sin, since you're going to sin. He says, if you sin, we have an advocate. It's a good thing to have a good lawyer. I mean, there are plenty of people who have gotten off, but because they got good lawyers, it didn't fit, so they had to quit. Because we have a good lawyer. We have a good lawyer in Jesus Christ. He's our advocate. He speaks to the Father. He speaks to God. He speaks on our behalf. He says, we have an advocate. And this advocate is with the Father. Look at what it says. We have an advocate with the Father. Number one, with the Father. The first thing with the Father means is that he's always with the Father. That's the first thing it means. The second thing it means that we have an advocate that speaks on behalf of us in front of the Father. In other words, the third thing it means with an advocate, with the Father, this advocate with the Father, the third thing it means is that he is the Father. You see how he, he lets us know that God the Father, God the Son are one. He says, we have an advocate. This advocate is with the Father. This advocate is the Father. This advocate speaks for us in the presence of the Father. Because the Father, God the Father, is the righteous judge. Look at what, he's, what else he says. Not only... Is he with the father and he speaks on us on behalf? He speaks to the father on our behalf, but he calls his name. Name is Jesus. Jesus Christ is his name. There are a lot of people who are named Jesus. But there's only one Jesus the Christ. So we have an advocate. Jesus the Christ, and he calls his name. When you pray, you better call his name. When you ask for favor, you ask favor in the name of Jesus. There is power in his name. You may say, well, I'm, I'm calling you today because Pastor Davis asked me to call you. Let me tell you. Some, some doors may open, but not all of them. But when you call the name Jesus, you expect doors to fly wide open. The problem, with, the problem is many of us 
do not use his name when it's time to use his name. I remember, I remember growing up, my, my dad had a, a, a LeSabre, Buick LeSabre. And it had about 450 horses on it. Why y'all looking like that? It had horses on it. What does that mean? It had horsepower. And you can barely hit that thing and phew, it's gone down the road. And we, could, we used to brag about how this Buick LeSabre could go to zero in, to 60 in, in a matter of seconds. But if we did not hit the accelerator, it was sitting on the side of the road just like any other car. It was sitting in the parking lot like any other vehicle. And that's what Christians are doing. They have power. They have hope. They have strength. All in the name of Jesus and not using it. You just got a lot of horsepower and never using it. You just got power in the name of Jesus and because you never call on his name, he doesn't come to the rescue. We need to call. We, if we go into court, we need to take the attorney there. And we need, to, we need to take the best attorney with us. Johnny Cochran was, con was, was, was considered a real good attorney. But Johnny Cochran does not measure up to Jesus. Racehorse Haynes in the state of Texas. Everybody wanted Racehorse Haynes, but everybody couldn't afford him. Racehorse Haynes, when, when he walked in the courtroom, he got attention. When you get a high power attorney, you expect high power results. When I call on the name of Jesus, I expect high power results. And when he does not appear to win the battle, I know he has won the war. Questions or comments? He's our advocate. His name is Jesus. Not only does, does he call his name, he also uses his title. And not only does he use his title, he, he also uses his power. Okay, his name is Jesus. Jesus is his name. He's our advocate. People walk around and say, who's your attorney? His name is Jesus. What's his title? His title is Christ. He is Jesus the Christ. Look at John. He calls his name and his title. He says, not only is is there power in his name? But when I call his title, he get ultimate respect. And check this out. Even his title means the anointed one. Even his title, the word Christ, means that he is the Messiah. The one who has come to deliver us. The one who has come to make us whole. He is our attorney. He's our defense attorney. His name is Jesus. His title is Christ. And not only does his title means that, that he is Jesus the Christ, his title also means he is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is our deliverer. Why does John talk about Jesus in this fashion? Because we all need to be delivered from sin. If we're going to get rid of sin, it's only, only going to happen through Jesus. Jesus the Christ is our deliverer. Jesus the Christ is our power source. Jesus the Christ is our advocate. Jesus the Christ is our defense attorney. Jesus the Christ speaks to the Father. And the reason why he speaks to the Father is because the Father is the one in whom we've sinned against. 
So Jesus Christ speaks to his father. Jesus Christ speaks to our father because we're saved, because we're born again. He speaks to our father on our behalf. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. Look at what John says next about Jesus. He's the righteous one. Look at, look at, look at how it reads. It, it, it says, he says, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ the righteous. Why does John mention that Jesus is righteous? He mentioned the fact that Jesus is righteous because when we sin, we are unrighteous. And no unrighteous person has the ability to speak to the father on an unrighteous person behalf. And because Jesus is not unrighteous, because Jesus is righteous, he's the only one qualified to speak to the righteous God. Woo, good God Almighty. Because Jesus Christ is the righteous one, because he has not sinned, because he is without sin, he is the only one qualified, the righteous one. Jesus the Christ is the only one qualified to speak to the Father on our behalf. Because God cannot stand, God cannot exist in the midst of sin. Who's the righteous one? Jesus. Who's the anointed one? Jesus. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. Who speaks for us? Jesus. Who's the advocate for us? Jesus. Who's our defense attorney? Jesus. He is the only one who can speak for us. And we get respect. And we are, he's heard. And our case is brought to the forefront. So if we sin, just remember, we got an advocate. Our advocate is Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. He is the one who speaks to us. And he speaks to God on our behalf. The problem is we don't use our power because we refuse to speak to Jesus. We run around here trying to speak to man. We trying to tell people, a piece of our mind. We need to tell Jesus what we're going through. He is the righteous one. He stands on our behalf. He is our attorney. He makes the difference for us. The verse number two. All of that is verse number one. And there's some more in there, but we just don't have time. Verse number one is all of that. Let's look at verse number two. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. What's the word propitiation or prepituation is what some people say. It's really propitiation. What is, what is that word propitiation? Well, y'all asking some good questions tonight. This word propitiation is appeasement. He is the appeasement to God's wrath. This word propitiation means that he is the atonement for our sins. Propitiation is the appeasement of God's wrath. If it had not been for Jesus, God's wrath would be let loose on us. You think that things are bad right now? If Jesus was not our propitiation, God wouldn't be appeased. God, our sins would not be atoned. Let me tell you what else this word propitiation means. Propitiation not only means appe appeasement, but it also means to gain favor. So God will give us favor only because Jesus has become our propitiation. So now we have favor with God. So it is 
the appeasement from God's wrath. It is the favor from God. It is the atonement from our sins. Let me tell you what else the word propitiation means. This word propitiation means that this is a gift of peace. It's a gift of peace. Because whenever we sin, what we do is that we have come to a point where we're facing off on God. When we're in war with somebody, we've faced off on them and we've declared war on them. We are duking it out with God. When we sin, we have faced off on God. Especially when we know we sin. When we sin, we're saying, God, I'm just as big as you are. When we sin, we are shaking our fist at God. When we sin, we are spitting in God's face. The example was on Calvary when the soldiers spit in Jesus' face. The example was when they were taking him from one judgment hall to the other, and then they, they went to torture him and they plucked hairs out of his face. And they didn't use the little tweezers that y'all use. And Jesus didn't have those wild hairs growing. He had beard. So the word propitiation, it, it means that we have the gift of peace now. Jesus pleads our case. He gives us the gift of peace. Let me tell you, we were at war with God. And because we were at war with God, we needed something and somebody to satisfy God's wrath. The word propitiation means that this is God's satisfaction. God was not satisfied with man until Jesus came along. That's why when we walk away from God, when we walk away from Jesus' principles, God is dissatisfied with us. It's like any parent. When your child does not do what you say do, and then they find themselves in a big old mess, they want you to pull them out of that mess. You become dissatisfied with them. And because God was not satisfied with mankind, Jesus came along as a propitiation. He pleaded our case for us. He satisfied God. And the only way Jesus was satisfying God was on Calvary. God wasn't satisfied until his child died. God was not satisfied until Jesus gave his life. God was not satisfied until Jesus became our propitiation and atoned our sin. Preached a sermon one time when I was a young guy at the Holman Street Church. I talked about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, and I used for a subject, I can't get no satisfaction. How many of y'all remember that song? It wasn't a church song. <laughs> the song was, I can't get no satisfaction. That boy in the hawk, hawk field could not get any satisfaction. It wasn't until he got back home to his daddy, which is a symbol of God willing to forgive us. And the only way God forgives us is if we take on Jesus the Christ. So Jesus, the propitiation, means that Jesus, the Christ, has become God's satisfaction. If God had never been satisfied, we never would have made it. Because if he had not been satisfied, there would be no appeasement for his wrath, and therefore God would let his wrath off on us and we can't stand his wrath. So he's the propitiation for our sins. He, Here's a perpetuation of what we do over and over again. Some of us do the same sins over and over again. Some of us do other sins. Jesus Christ is a perpetuation for it. He is God's satisfaction. He is, he is God's appeasement. He gives us the favor of God. We're able to gain favor with God through Jesus Christ. He's our gift of peace. We're no longer at war. 
You see, some of us think Jesus, and, and he did. We, we believe Jesus died on Calvary with his hands stretched out and they nailed him tight, and he did. But in the spiritual realm, you must get to a point in your life where you don't just see Jesus hanging on the cross with his arms stretched out. I don't see Jesus hanging on the cross with his arms stretched out, and that's the only way I see him. I see Jesus with one hand reaching up and catching the holy hand of man, of God, and reaching down and catch the unholy hand of mankind. So Jesus, the righteous son of God, the righteous one, is the only one fit to save us. He's the only one fit to deliver us. So Jesus, when he died on Calvary, yes, he hung on Calvary. Yes, he was stressed out on Calvary. Yes, physically he died on Calvary. But spiritually, he reached up and caught the holy hand of God, reached down and caught the unholy hand of man, and brought a bitter dispute to a happy end. He brought a bitter dispute to a happy ending. He is the propitiation for our sins. His name is Jesus. Jesus the Christ. First John chapter two, we're at verse number three. When we look further, we find out that, not, well, let's look at verse number two one more time. And it says, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Who can die? One man died for the sins of the entire world. He says, not just for our sins only. He's saying, he didn't just die for those of us who are listening to me. The Apostle John says, my little children, I'm writing this unto you that you may not sin. But if you do sin, just remember we have an advocate. His name is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah of God. He speaks with God on our behalf. He is our defense attorney. He is our intercessor. He's our mediator in the midst of our sins. And then he comes back and say, and he himself, nobody else, is our propitiation. He's our, he, is, he is what God been waiting on to be satisfied. He appeases God on our behalf. Then he says, but also for the whole world. There's no one can do it like Jesus. He says, not only, not only was he the perpetuation for our sin, not only is he the perpetuation for our sins, he says, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus came, lived, and died, was crucified on behalf of the whole wide world. So everybody got a chance. He died for everybody. He is blessing everybody. Let me rush through verses six through verses three through six for you. Now, by this, we know that we know him. Because we know that he's our advocate, because we know he has become our perpetuation, because he has become the satisfaction for God's wrath. Now, by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. We know him if we keep his commandments. In other words, a joker can talk about how well they know God, but they don't keep his commandments. Something's wrong. Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Are there certain commandments we got to keep? All of them. Is it just the 10? Some people thrive on the 10. If I can just keep the 10, I'm doing all right. And they brag about the 10. The, the text declares that we know him and we demonstrate the fact that we know him when we keep his commandments. We got to keep his commandments. Then he goes on to say, not only should we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, 
and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. I didn't know where the senior saints got that from. Hey, said, boy, they said, first of all, the devil is a lying wonder and the truth ain't in him. They said, the devil is a lying wonder. And they said, the truth is not in him. In other words, there is no way the devil can tell the truth. And they try to convince you, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't lie, because if you lie, you steal. And if you steal, you, you misuse somebody. They said, don't, don't be lying. Don't, I mean, just tell me the truth, and I'll deal with that. Don't lie, because if you lie, you steal. The Bible, the Bible says, and, it, and it's crystal clear here, it says, if you, if you say you know him, and does not keep his commandments. He who says that is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now there's a different thing in telling a lie and being a liar. You, know? <laughs> you see the difference in telling a lie. And none, all, all of it is bad. None of it is good. But the difference in telling a lie Deacon Afrin, and being a liar. When you're a liar you just practice lying. You, you get up in the morning and see which lie I can tell now. You, you wake up with a lie on your heart. You go down, you, you, you eat during the week, during the day with a lie on your heart. You wake up and you go to sleep with a lie on your heart. I mean, some folk are just liars. They're not accomplishing anything. They just love to lie. Just, just what you doing? And they'll tell you a lie. Where you been? Tell you a lie. How you been acting? Tell you a lie. I love, I, my favorite is when I get around little children, say, you been good? <laughs> then my next question is, if I ask your dad and mama, would they say you've been good? So he says, if you don't keep the commandments, then you are a liar. And not only are you a liar, the truth is not in you. Verse number five. But whoever keeps the word Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. Whoever, whoever keep the commandments, whoever keeps the word of God, the love of God is perfected in him or her. This word perfection is, a, is completeness. None of us are perfect. But it's talking perfection or perfected. It means to be complete. And it also is the idea of maturity. And maturity means you're growing constantly. You're not a baby anymore. People don't have to pat you to burp you. They don't have to pat on you every time something goes wrong. You're growing up. You, you, you're growing into maturity. When you have the love of God, when you, love, you keep the word of God and you love the word of God. The problem with some people, they don't love God's word. How you know they don't love it? Because they don't study it. They don't read it. They don't have time for it. When you love something, you got time for it. If a boy loves a girl, he, he, he got time for it. I mean, he takes her books and run. He, he runs across the field, runs across the yard, grab her books, rush with her to her locker, put her books in her locker, and then run back across the yard. Just that little time he spent with her shows that he's, he's mature and he's loving her. Who used to carry your books? <laughs> he says... But whosoever keeps the word is truly the love of God. It, it's, it's true. It says truly the love of God is perfected in him. The love of God is completing him. It's completing him. The love of God is maturing him. And the love of God is mature in him. You can tell when a person is maturing, they're always growing. 
Same thing that made them cry last week, they, they welcome it this week. If you're suffering from the same problems as you were six months ago, that means you haven't grown up. That means you need to spend more time in the word of God. Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. It's completing him. And see, some people think that they need a, a person to complete them. They need a person to perfect them. They need a person to make them whole. And Joker's walking around telling folk, you ain't whole without me. <laughs> Let me tell you, it doesn't matter who you date, who you live with, who you're married to. When we leave here, none of that's going to matter. The smart, the smart ones, the Pharisees asked Jesus, you know, Moses' law allow a man to marry his, his brother's wife when his brothers die. What if she marries seven different brothers? When she get to heaven, whose husband she going to be? Whose wife she going to be? Which one is her husband? Jesus said, in heaven, there is no giving and taking of marriage. So you need to make the best of what you got down here. And because it's just for down here. Says, says to us today, perfect what we have. Let the word perfect us. And when you love the Lord, you show your love for the Lord. You show your love for the word by keeping his commandments. By this, we know that we are in him. When you're in the word and the word is perfecting you and you're perfecting the love of God in you through the word of God. Guess what? then we know that he's in you. And by this, we know that we are in him. You've heard people talk about it. They in church, but the church not in them. They show up, but they, they just showing up. They just checking the box. But whenever you keep his commandments, by this, we know that we are in him. We have to be in him. We have to be in him. Verse number six. He who says he abides in him. Ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He who says that they abide in Jesus Christ. Ought to walk just like Jesus Christ. He says. He who says he abides in him ought himself also walk just as he walks. St. John, John, the apostle John and St. John talks about uh, the, the branches. He talks about abiding in me and, and my word abiding in you. John chapter 15, he says, as, as you abide in me, I abide in you. And you ask me what you will and I give it to you. You got to walk with him. He has to walk in you. And this word walk doesn't mean putting one step in front of the other. When he talks about abiding, he talks about having a habit of obeying God. One writer says that it has to be habitual. You have to have habitual uh, obedience. Your settings are set on obeying God. And when you're walking with God, you're conforming to his likeness. You're being transformed to his ways. Not conforming to the things of the world, but you are conforming to the likeness of Jesus Christ. You got to walk with it. I give you this analogy and I close. I, I, I've heard it a couple of times. And it fits right into this text. Pastor Jamal Bryant of New Birth Faith in Atlanta, Georgia, tells a story about when he took his two girls to the mall. And when he took his two girls to the mall, the first two, he said, OK, I'm going to give all y'all fifty dollars. So he gave the first two their fifty dollars and they both ran off and got their stuff. 
They knew they only had $50. They're going to only get $50 worth of stuff. The first two, and he said, when you get your $50 worth of stuff, meet me back at the cash register. And we all check out together. The first two girls run off. They ran off and they got their $50 worth of stuff. And as they were shopping, the other girl say, Dad, I want to walk with you. He said, yeah, sure. So as they begin to walk, the third girl say, Daddy, you're the best dad in the world. She said, you, you like that coat, Daddy? Yeah, that's a nice coat. You think I ought to get that coat, Daddy? Yeah, go on and get the coat. They turn the, they turn the corner. Daddy, you see that dress right there, Daddy? You like that dress, Daddy? Daddy, you're the best dad in the world. He said, yeah, that's a nice dress. You think I ought to get that dress, Daddy? Yeah, go on and get that dress. Turn the corner, there are some shoes there. Daddy, you are the best daddy in the world. Daddy, you like those shoes there? Yeah, those are some nice shoes. You think I ought to get those shoes? Yeah, go and get those shoes. By the time they got back to the cash register, the other two girls were already there with their $50 worth of stuff. The third girl shows up, and she got $150 worth of stuff. So the other two girls begin to ask the question, how does she get so much stuff? And we just got this little $50 worth of stuff. And she told them, because I walked with my dad. <laughs> she said, y'all ran off and got y'all stuff. But I just walked with him. She didn't tell him anything about how she told him how, how great of a daddy he was. She just said, I walked with daddy. That's why I got triple the stuff that y'all got. What John says is, we got to walk with Jesus. And we got to walk with him. We got to walk with God. Walk with your daddy. And if, you got, if he has blessings, you have blessings. If you want blessings to overflow, you got to walk with him. And as you walk with him and as you appreciate him and when you do what is right, you show your appreciation to him. And as you appreciate him, he's able to bless you. The problem is a lot of us get our $50 and we run off. <laughs> but when you walk with him <laughs> and you walk with him and you appreciate him and you walk with him, and you appreciate him, and you walk with him, he becomes your propitiation. It is God's satisfaction. You, this propitiation is God's satisfaction, and he withholds his wrath because, number one, you call his name Jesus. <laughs> number two, you give forth his title, Christ. Number three, he is our advocate. And our advocate pleads our case. Our advocate intercedes for us. Our advocate is our defense attorney. Our advocate talks to God on our behalf. Boy, that's good news. He talks to God on our behalf. He intercedes for us. And, and only he is the righteous one. And guess what? The reason why we have to go to the righteous one, because all of us are unrighteous. And it just would not serve you well to have an unrighteous man pleading the case of the unrighteous. John says the righteous one pleads our case. And it was the righteous one that died on Calvary. He pleaded our case on Calvary. The righteous God himself, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, died on Calvary. They laid him in a bar of tomb. Early that third day morning, he was pleading our case. Early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Holy Ghost power. Anointing power. And that word Christ, the word Christ means the anointed one. The word Christ means the Messiah. He delivers us. He's our Messiah. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try Jesus. He's the righteous one. He's the one who fulfills us. He's the one who's the satisfaction. And without Jesus, I have to come to the conclusion. I can't get no satisfaction.
If you've never tried Christ, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. You ought to try Jesus. He is the righteous Lamb of God. If you've never tried him, just bow your head right now and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving, your, saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're born again. We believe that you're saved if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal savior. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the advocate is present. Jesus the Christ is the one who makes us whole. Inbox me and let me know that you want to join the New Beginning Church. We'd be glad to fellowship with you. Be glad to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by, by Zelle. You can Zelle, and our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your offering, your tithes, your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459 Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We are constantly praying for those on our prayer list. And we're glad to see Sister Corey Woods with us tonight. We're lifting her before the Lord. We thank God that she's walking. We thank God that she's breathing. We thank God that she's living. Thank God for, for blessing Sister Corey Woods. What a testimony that God has, has given her, that God has given us. We thank God for it. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us, Father God, safe. We thank you for touching and healing. We thank you, Father God, for ministering to us. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus the Christ, the advocate, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the anointed one. We thank you, Father, that he pleads our case. He speaks to you, God, on our behalf. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you continue to bless us to walk with you and bless your name and glorify you and represent you well. Bless us that as we sin, we give it over to you and you bless us to continue to keep your commandments. Now, Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done with us through us. Bless us as we continue to study your word, that your word will be clear, your word will be relevant, that your word, Father God, will be timely, and it will be accurate. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Let us join in by saying, amen and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.